crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentation of their women. Well, gamers have always been looking for the movie that perfectly embodies the traditional fantasy D&D experience. And by traditional D&D experience, I'm talking about old school here. Anyone who played in the early to mid 80s knows what I'm talking about. Robbing the merchant just because you can, <laughs> saving the princess, exploring those dungeon and wilderness settings for fortune and glory, and then coming back to town to go on a two-day bender bragging about your deeds. Uh, there's many worthwhile candidates out there for sure. Uh, a lot of people think that Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy, based on the classic series by Tolkien, is the quintessential set of fantasy movies, especially the first one where the uh, fellowship is formed. And like many of you, those movies are amongst my favorites in the genre, but I don't think they quite capture the average tabletop experience. Certainly not old school tabletop experience, just due to the sheer world ending scope of the story told. Some may point to a movie like 1980's Hawk the Slayer, which came out at a time when the genre was still kind of finding itself. Uh, then there's movies like The Sword and the Sorcerer, Deathstalker, The Warrior and the Sorceress, all of which I've done in-depth reviews of on this channel. You can also add movies like Red Sonja and scores of other ripoffs too. And they're all great in their own way, but not quite what we're looking for here. Some might ask, why not the most recent D&D &D movie, Honor Among Thieves? And while that movie wasn't as bad as I or many people thought it would be, let's not pretend that it was good either. <laughs> it may reflect the D&D &D experience of many modern day D&D &D players, you know, the tourists, but the millennial humor in the movie, the ubiquitous magic, and the fat dragons, uh, it's just a no-go for me. So no way on this one. Then, of course, we come to John Melius's masterpiece, Conan the Barbarian, from 1982. This movie is actually in my top 10 movies of all time, period. The score by Basil Poldaris is magnificent, the story's tight, and even if it doesn't quite conform to Howard's source material in fact, it does capture the spirit of Conan and his world. Still, as good as this movie is, and it is great, I don't think it completely gets the essence of that old school D&D gaming experience. No, the movie I think does this in spades is actually the sequel to Conan the Barbarian. That's right, 1984's Conan the Destroyer. I know, sacre bleu, I hear some of you saying, but hear me out, huh? This movie is often overlooked and dismissed. As a movie, it is inferior to the original, no question. Uh, but so many people have unfairly castigated this movie solely because it wasn't the original. And while it doesn't have John Melius directing it, the movie was competently overseen by Richard Fleischer. I'm not here to defend Conan the Destroyer as high art, but I will defend it as the best D&D &D movie ever made. In fact, around the time of this movie, TSR made a few adventures in the Conan world to tie into the popularity of the franchise. Uh, so without further ado, and in no particular order, here are seven reasons this movie captures the old school D&D zeitgeist like no other. John Melius famously told producer Dino De Laurentiis that if they didn't cast Arnold Schwarzenegger as Conan, they'd have to build him. <laughs> and boy, is that true. Uh, he looks the part. Uh, he leads through strength, drive, and in this movie, his reputation from deeds done after the first one. And you can fill in those blanks with the fantastic original short stories of Robert E. Howard. Uh, when we see Conan in this movie at the start, he's already an accomplished mid to high level thief. And right from the get go, we see him talking to his companion about doing some old school monkey shines. <laughs> We made the merchant angry. Are you surprised? Well, we didn't steal everything he had. We didn't have time. Uh, that's right. Back in the day, instead of going to festivals or having girl boss tieflings shame your character for being part of the patriarchy, it was common to go on mini adventures where you just stole stuff from local merchants and lords. 
and it was damn fun too. Later, when the quest gets going, uh, we see Arnold picking up a few companions he knows he'll need along the way to help him out. And you can almost imagine hearing a DM saying, oh, I have uh, two more players who want to join our group, and I know just how I can work him into the party pretty easily next week. <laughs> Say hello to Akira and Zula. In the end, uh, because it's a movie, of course, Conan does most of the heavy lifting, uh, but I was surprised at how much each of the supporting characters had moments to shine throughout. And not just as actors, but doing things a D&D character would want to do in their given class. Uh, and there's also nothing wrong, though, with one character who emerges with a little something extra. And you could do a whole lot worse than the legendary barbarian thief and future king, Conan. Want to learn how to play a D&D thief? No, not the modern 5e kind, where you're essentially a frontline warrior who gets his backstab bonus almost automatically and rivals the fighter for combat effectiveness. I'm talking about a selfish, shifty, dangerous lout. One who sneaks in for that opportunity to shiv the enemy for maximum pain and then scurries back into the shadows, content that he risked about as much as he dare by doing that. Then you should just copy Malik, portrayed by veteran character actor Tracy Walter. Malik is a timeless blueprint for the classic D&D thief always looking to steal, always trying to minimize risk, and always out for himself. At least until guilt or the threat of a split party gets the better of him. Now, a lot of people didn't like the character Malik because he was the comic relief in a movie that many thought should have been a lot more serious. But in retrospect, it's pretty tame stuff. Uh, just take a look at the cringy comedy <laughs> in Honor Among Thieves, and... Tell me you don't owe old Malik an apology these days. But watch this character closely in the movie, and you'll see roguish inspiration for any table trying to capture the old-school feel. The main plot of Conan the Destroyer is a simple and classic one. The evil queen wants the party to escort the innocent princess Jenna to recover an artifact that only she can, in two stages. First by finding a key, and then by using that key to unlock the artifact itself, which is a horn. Not just any horn, mind you, but the horn that will bring life to the dreaming god Dagoth. Teramis doesn't really tell Conan the whole story about the horn, but her promise is vague enough to placate him because she dangles the ultimate prize as a reward. Resurrection of his fallen comrade and lost love, Valeria, from the first movie. That old chestnut has been dangled by <laughs> nefarious DMs to adventuring parties probably since the game was founded. It creates the ultimate motivation for the party to do something that they might not do on their own due to the lack of a huge monetary reward. But as Malik shows us, there's always attacks of opportunity when it comes to plunder. And while not common, having a character inside the party as a hidden traitor that's in league with the DM's main villain, has probably been tried at many tables over the years. If done properly, it can lead to a very memorable campaign. But it's hard for a player to keep that kind of secret. That's why it's usually an NPC that stabs the party in the back. But think of how cool it would be if you could pull it off. Imagine yourself playing someone like Bombata here, a huge warrior with orders to play nice until the right moment and then whack the boss of the party. <laughs> Bombata is a great character, played by the larger-than-life Wilt Chamberlain. He hides his true motives by being protective of Jenna, which is understandable, he's her bodyguard after all. But after the Queen's Guard attacks the group, once the key is retrieved, they get suspicious of him, and for good reason. I can almost imagine the table talk taking place after something like that happens. Dude, you're totally a double agent. No, 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 man, it was all just a misunderstanding. <laughs> By the way, do yourself a favor and look at some stories about how strong Wilt Chamberlain was. He may have been the strongest athlete to have ever played any major sport, ever. At the end of the movie, he was on set with, of course, Arnold, and the equally larger-than-life Andre the Giant, who was in the costume of the creature Dagoth. 
and they both took turns seeing how they could make Arnold, Mr. Universe, and Mr. Olympia multiple times look like a child. Unlike the first movie, we actually get a pretty cool dungeon of sorts in this one. The gang breaks in to recover the Horn of Dagoth, finding out the secret that Queen Terramis has hidden from them. Princess Jenna must die to bring life to the Dreaming God. Conan at first ignores this bit of horrific news, blinded by the resurrection of Valeria. When they do recover the horn and do some quick looting along the way, they discover the place is guarded by a group of zealots who need to be taken down. And this is a great, great stretch of the movie where every character gets to shine a little bit. But before they got that horn, they needed the key. In this case, a giant gemstone. And that was one inside the crystal palace of its guardian, the powerful wizard Toth Amon. Toth Amon in the movie is nothing like the wizard in Robert E. Howard's stories, but that's okay. Uh, he's a worthy opponent here nonetheless. Again, this is a very D&D stretch of the movie. The group has to find a way into the magical palace by swimming underneath it, and eventually comes to confront the wizard himself. The wizard turns himself into a very Howard-like creature that smashes Conan around until Conan discovers that the mirrors in the room they're in is the key to defeating it. The mirrors as a way to damage the wizard is clever and very much something you can envision in a fantasy RPG for defeating what seems to be an unbeatable foe. The only disappointing thing here was that the rest of the party didn't get to do much aside from cheer Conan on, but even that rings familiar for there are certainly times when a fellow PC is stuck on the other side of a trap and has to find their own way out. Fortunately for the gang here, it was the legend who did. There's some other great places too. The Queen's Palace is truly inspiring. Uh, from the part where the party has to find a way into the drainage tunnel underneath it to the final battle in the throne room itself. It's a really magnificent setting. I like the way magic is handled in the movie. In a perfect game world for me, magic would be mysterious and or evil, such as it's always presented in the world of Robert E. Howard. A force of corruption if you dabble into the dark arts, but also a powerful tool. The corruption can be seen with the wizard Toth Amon, who shapeshifts into an ethereal bird, and then almost takes Conan down by turning himself into a powerful primeval creature. Akira, the party wizard, uses magic to battle the zealot wizard guarding the horn of Dagoth. When he wins, he is completely exhausted, which I really liked. It was a nice touch. It's not just a parlor trick, but something that really taxes him physically. Perhaps in game terms, he pushed his spell to the limit and incurred a temporary penalty. Either way, you don't see magic used callously or mundanely in this world. Uh, it's serious business and deadly too, as it always should be in any game. And finally, we have a final battle in the movie worthy of any adventure ending battle a DM has ever brought to their table. The heroes have survived the wizard's palace, a treacherous attack by the queen's guards, a guarded dungeon, and now they need to rescue the princess back in Shadazar, before she's sacrificed, of course. Standing in their way is Bombata, their old friend, <laughs> a castle full of guards, and a freaking Lovecraftian god brought to life by dark magic. What more do you want? <laughs> Everyone throws in and does their part, with Conan, of course, carrying most of the load. But that is okay. He is the damn hero here, after all, right? And once the day is won, the god is defeated, we have the denouement, where the party gets their final rewards. Zula... Malik and Akira all take cushy jobs under the new queen, Jenna. But Conan spurns her offer to be king. Rule Shadizar with me. I will have my own kingdom. My own queen. He has designs to be a king by his own hand someday. And he probably just wants to keep adventuring. He'd have to retire his character, wouldn't he? <laughs> of course, we know from the short stories that he eventually does get to rule Aquilonia as a wise king. And uh, it's a shame we never got that third movie in this series that was always rumored that it was going to be made, um, where all of this uh, would have happened. Uh, so we can only imagine, and again, as I said, 
just read the stories of Robert E. Howard to fill in those blanks. They do a fantastic job. There's a couple of really good stories with Conan as the king. Well, that about does it. What say you? Do I have it all wrong about Conan the Destroyer? No, I don't think so. <laughs> it's the little brother that makes good. Is it really the best old school D&D &D movie? Uh, or do you prefer something like Honor Among Thieves? Say it isn't so. Either way, <laughs> let me know in the comments uh, where you think I got it all right or dead wrong. Also, remember to join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for The Lair. That's our weekly live stream. Me and a few friends make merry, do a little wisecracking, talk about RPGs, occasionally talk to guests, go over events of the day, and uh, a lot more. It's uh, always a good time, and we would love to see you there. Well, that's all for now. I hope you guys have a great, great rest of your day, and until we talk again, goodbye. Fred Forge makes two great games that aren't afraid to poke a little fun at the people who, quite frankly, need a little fun poked at them. <laughs> First is the quick and hilarious Virtue Signal, the game where you play a social justice warrior trying to attract followers to your cause before the other players can tear you down. Then there's the mammoth Portland Occupied Zone, or POZ. In this strategy game, you play as a complete disaster of a human being, trying to reshape Portland into a slacker Marxist utopia. Bring a few friends and warm up that throwing arm for some Molotov cocktails.